So now that we have uh, gone through the 3D Deconvolve command and understand the, the model, um, oh, I see I have some extra stuff still plotted here. Let's actually uh, look at the results in AFNI. So I'll uh, just lower these windows briefly. We can, uh, for now, let's leave um, let's leave the blurred time series on the bottom. Uh, we'll, we'll actually change that in a moment uh, because we want to see all three runs. But we can uh, use controller A and set the underlay perhaps to be uh, like an anatomy. And maybe I'll just use the one with the skull again. We don't need, need the graph window anymore. And we'll set the overlay to be the stats uh, output. So stats.ft. And lo and behold, we see absolutely nothing. So maybe there is no activity. Open a couple of windows. OK, so let's turn on the overlay. And uh, now I'm going to immediately obscure my overlay. Uh, going into the Define Overlay menu, so I'll toggle this, uh, this window pane open. Um, it, the, the default volume of index 0 is showing the full F stat. If we click on that, we can see all the, uh, all the volumes in the data set. Note that uh, so 0 through 12 full F stat vary the, uh, up to the mean uh, GLT coefficient T stat and F stat. Note that for each one of these conditions, like after the full F stat, we have for the visual reliable condition, we have a coefficient, which is the, the beta weight. It's the, uh, the effect size, the magnitude of the bold response. We have, the co we have that. Then we have the T stat to show the uh, significance in some way, an estimate of how much, uh, how significant it is, uh, basically based on the variance explained by the regressor as opposed to the rest of the model. That's, that's uh, and, and to be specific, that is comparing the entire model with and without the visual reliable regressor. The entire model, including the auditory reliable. So the whole rest of the model is there with and without this regressor, and we see how much uh, incremental variance it explains. And that that uh, the T stat and F stat basically are going to say the same information here, and then we have the same uh, outputs for the auditory reliable, the the effect size. We have the T stat and the F stat, and then we have those same three outputs for the V minus A uh, GLT and then the uh, mean GLT. And as a reminder, uh, if this menu gets long and it's hard to just click down and even see everything. You can, anytime you have a, a menu button with one of these little boxes on the right side, you can go to the text to the left of that box and right click, and that'll give you a drop down menu that's a little easier to work with. And this is a scrollable menu if it were long enough to scroll. So, and just, uh, just to mention one other, other thing, if we go back to our terminal window, we can run 3D info on stats. Ft, and it'll show us much the same thing. Well, let me add the verb option, but this this shows all the outputs in there, and it includes. Let's see. So it includes all of uh, with the dash verb option includes output for every subric, every volume. And just to show you one little, one more thing, instead of verb, if we just want subric info, we can say subric info is an option. And that won't output, it won't output the history, it won't output the, uh, the uh, main information, the header and the voxel size and that sort of stuff. Uh, dash subric info is just that stuff. So you can also see the list of, uh, volume indices in here. Again, the same labels, the full F stat and the visual coefficient, T stat and F stat. The ranges for each of these, um, their, their float indices, it gives the statistical parameters for the full F stat and then the, uh, the, the, the individual F stats and then the T stat. So 
basically uh, we had a model with 450 time points um, but we censored some of them and then we had a bunch of regressors in our model remember the model had uh, what 18 motion plus 12 uh, uh, 12 pull arts plus two regressors of interest so we had 32 uh, regressors in the model and we here it's uh, this is um, 450 minus 38 so there must be another six regressors uh, six time points that we censored to bring us down to 412 but we'll, we'll see that later so uh, this is just a reminder of what's in what's in the volumes and alternate viewing from you know looking at this interface and now let's look at something useful let's let's go back uh, let's let's actually focus on first the, the contrast visual minus auditory and I will start by looking setting the Ole volume to be seven and the threshold volume the threshold volume to be eight so we can threshold on the t-stat and we'll look uh, we'll do the coloring based on the uh, beta weight and I think maybe I've got this yeah I've got the opacity pretty low so I'll make the opacity higher so the color is more clear for now let's just constant let's just focus on the coloring of this whoops Come on, grab that corner. There we go. And now let's let's set the uh, threshold to something reasonable. If we uh, we can drag the threshold slider bar around, you know, this is defaulting to ten to the first. You can change that to go from zero to one. Zero to ten is the default. Zero to ten, uh, zero to uh, uh, a hundred thousand in this case. But of course, that's not not very useful. So if we stick to uh, up to 10 and slide this around it does threshold fairly nicely so if we but if we want to uh, pick just something simple to look at there are two things t uh, we might choose to do one is just drag the slider up until most of the speckly stuff outside the brain disappears so like this uh, an alternative that's the p-value of 1.4 times 10 to the negative fifth or we could right click on THR up here and set the p-value to something in particular or even go straight and set p-value equals 0 0.001 but 0 0.001 is uh, maybe a little too lenient here because the results are strong again um, as you see in the time series there's a very clear effect um, from uh, these tasks uh, when compared to uh, fixation crosshair so um, the th statistics are pretty strong so we might drag it up a little bit more okay that's absolutely perfect 4.032 or we can even type in a p-value we're at 10 to the negative fifth here so let's do something that we can all agree on so we should obviously set it to 4.7 times 10 to the negative fifth I'll just type it directly point so 00047 Clearly, that's what we should be using. Who knows why? Okay, beautiful. So uh, let's just let's just look at some of the colors and stuff, and make sure we understand what we're seeing in the image window. So, for example, here, if I go to some place, uh, let's even jump to those coordinates we we liked. If I jump to X, Y, Z, and go to that one voxel of interest. So here we are. And let's see uh, if we look at focus on this voxel right here. Notice like up in the maybe that my uh, coronal image is a little more clear. You can see there uh, that this current voxel isn't colored at all. Even though we see a beautiful pattern down here, we don't see any color. Again, we're looking at the uh, the, we're thresholding based on the t-stat of the contrast if v minus a is significant that is to say you know if, if the, there's a, you see a significant difference between the effect of the visual reliable and the effect of the auditory reliable so maybe they're too similar at this voxel maybe this at this location in the brain it doesn't care that much whether the uh, audio is degraded or whether the visual is degraded since we're in the visual area, I guess that would be 
the, the visual degradation doesn't really make a difference. So the T stat is actually only 2.07, uh, 0 2.08 say. So that's less than 4.11, so it's not uh, large enough to survive the thresholding. So that simply says in the uh, AFNI interface, we don't see any color. Because the threshold is too low, we're not going to color it. That's, that's a positive and negative decision. If we come over here, I, I just moved a little to the right. I don't know if the, it's clear in the th crosshairs, if I close that and open it. How about I'll uh, crop this a little bit? Crop. I'll grab, put a box right around my location. How's that? And let's turn the. How about navy blue? Nah. We'll turn the crosshairs to. How about some purple color? Red. Anyway, they're a little they're a little too thin here, but you can you can see them. And at the current voxel location, if I close and open it, uh, you can see that we're not seeing any color here. And the value here is negative three point nine, so that's still too small. But once we leap over into the blue, you can see the current value is negative four point uh, five nine, say. So that's negative. It's small, but in magnitude, it exceeds this. This is a uh, this is a two-sided test we're performing, so um, it's significant enough to, well, actually, the threshold number is simply large enough in magnitude to survive this, so we do see color. Okay, and now for, I'll double click the, click the crop to turn that on. Well, I'll leave it on. I'll leave this on, uh, just so we can focus in, uh, zoom in on one window. So now that we've decided uh, whether we past the th threshold or not implies whether there is color or not at each voxel in the brain. What color do we get? Well, the beta weight here is negative 0.216. So that's pretty close to zero. Currently, we've got it uh, scaling from at a range of 4.29. That's, I forget, like a f uh, 95 percentile or something like that from the uh, overlay volume. So that's an that's an automatic scale. So the perhaps the uh, you know the overlay values in the beta weight the the contrast go from negative forty four up to fifty two say approximately. That includes outside the brain. That's why they're so large. Um, but the, the ninety five percentile might be four point two two. So we let those values positive four point two two and negative four point two two get the most extreme colors. Anything farther away from zero than those will get those same colors. It's red all the way up and it's blue all the way down and turtles all the way left. So this light blue color is close to zero on a range of 4.2. You know, we're right in there. Uh, if I right click here, I can see, uh, I can barely read that, but the value is negative 0.41. So this level gets, uh, yeah, negative 0.41 would get this blue, and negative 0.2 is going to be a little higher, somewhere up there. And the dark blue up here, that's a value of negative 3.4. That's got to be down here somewhere. I see negative 3.5. So it's basically right around here on the color bar, so it gets that darkness of blue. And if we jump, again, I'll jump back to the XYZ of interest, 2486.14. Um, at this voxel, well, it's not colored, so let's shift over to some neighboring, let's go to the dark orange over here. That value is uh, 2.8, you know, so that's going to be up here somewhere. 2.5, yeah, 2.8, so right around, right around this dark orange level. Okay, so that's, that's the thresholding and coloring. Now let's now let's look more closely at the actual values in the data set. So again, this is uh, we're showing voxels where the contrast, the difference between V minus A is is fairly large. But you know, contrasts aren't magical. This is 
the v minus a, the way we construct it is in the 3D to convolve command, that's got a copy of it, it's literally the vis beta weight plus the negative auditory beta weight. That's liter literally what the computation is. So you see at this voxel, if we if we stay here, the contrast is like 2.8, but if we go to the vis, vis coefficient, the beta weight is 6.42. And then if, if that's clear, so switching the overlay to the vis beta weight, the overlay value at this voxel is 6.42. If we switch to the odd beta weight, the odd coefficient, it's 3.62. So then V minus A is just that difference, and you get the, uh, the 2.8 value as the difference. And if you notice the time series here, the first two bumps are fairly small, the next three bumps are pretty big. That's what we're looking for. These, we're, at, we're at a voxel where V minus A is big or significant. In this case, V minus A has a difference of 2.8. So the V beta weight must be 2.8 greater than the odd beta weight. So these, these visual responses are much bigger than the initial two auditory responses. And uh, just to see if that goes across all three runs, if... Uh, I'm, I'll move these up a little bit. If we, and the bottom controller, let's switch the underlay from just a single run. Uh, I'll actually close this window because I'm going to have to make the graph wider. Let's change the underlay to be all runs. Here it is, all runs.ft. That's simply the uh, the that's simply the three scale uh, by uh, data sets concatenated. So 150 time points in each of those. This is 450. The AFNI proc, uh, the AFNI proc uh, script created that itself. And maybe we're not at a great voxel here because we've got a spike in the data due to that time point 42. But let me hit a couple lowercase m's and we'll just focus on the central voxel. Then those spikes won't be where we are. So here's the central voxel. And how do we get a more clear idea? I mean, this looks this looks very clear as it is, but uh, it would be nice to look at the fit time series to see how well the model gets fit to the data. And we can we should be able to see the actual uh, how close the fit looks to the black curve. So to to do that, you use the double plot method using or the data set number n plugin to access that uh, note that that's only useful because we can see it a clear bold uh, response curve in the data you know we've got 20 second events and we're comparing visual and auditory against fixation so it's very strong if you have a fast event related design your the best voxel in your data set will look like noise so there's there's hardly even any point looking at it. But here we can see something, so let's look at that. So if I open the opt menu in the graph window, uh, we can go down to TRAN1D, and TRAN1D is supposed to be a time transformation. The TRAN0D, zero dimension is like one point, one dimensional is like the time axis. So let's change none. In, under TRAN1D, let's change none to data set number n, and maybe I'm going too low on my screen because I want to save the bottom. I'll just raise it up a little bit. I'll cheat and I'll make this short briefly. Tran 1D and then I'll select data set number N. And that opens up. Why is this so tiny? Oh, I hit the data set number 2 plugin. Okay, let's try again. Data set number N. Okay, and I'll cancel this thing. So there's the data set number n plugin, and now I'll make the time series a little bigger again. The graph window. Yeah. Okay. So this is all runs. This is the scaled input for all three runs. If I set my first input in the uh, data set number n plugin, and note that that's number n because you could actually grab, you could plot many time series on top of this one if you wanted to for some 
devious purpose but we just want to plot the fit time series so we'll choose the data set and we'll select the fit time series fits that fits dot ft 450 time points set and I don't like using red for that I prefer dark blue if it <coughs> if there's an option and set and keep just keeps the controller here set and close makes it disappear and there we go so we we see the fit time series on top of our voxel of interest notice there's a big spike in the fit why is that there's probably no big spike like that in the regressors even in the motion regressors they probably don't have a big spike like that well the fact is that's actually due to censoring at a censored time point uh, a spike should not hurt the statistics and the statistics are based on the the variance in the residuals so uh, the the earth's time series is actually going to be zero at a time point that we have censored because we want the output time series the the length to still be 450 time points even you know since the input was that so the censored time points have to be filled with something so in the residuals, the censored time points are zero, but that means the fit time series has to have the original value at the censored time points. So this is a perfect fit. That spike is actually simply a perfect fit to the data because we censored here. Actually, it looks like, looks like both of these spikes are a perfect fit to the data. So that we had multiple time points censored right there. So fantastic. Ignoring that, uh, the second thing we can notice is that even without that notion, the blue curve isn't perfectly smooth, even though our model is smooth. We have polar terms, those are all smooth. The regressors of interest are smooth, but oh yeah, we also have motion regressors. So the bumps in the blue time series must be due to the motion regressors actually fitting the time series. Okay, now getting to the, the important part, uh, remember we had our two regressors of interest. Let me go back and plot those just for kicks. Where's my last 1D plot command? Now yeah, let's go to the, the no sensor version here. So here's where we plotted uh, the, from the, without censoring, um, the regressors of interest. So here are the two regressors of interest, and I'll just leave that up here briefly along with our time series. So we can see both of them. Well, it doesn't fit the same. Okay, I'm going to go back and look at one of them at a time. Let's just look at the uh, visual reliable one, for example. So I'm going to go under the FIM menu, pick ideal. So I did FIM, pick ideal, and then uh, the AFNI proc script, we haven't gotten to it yet, but it actually pulls the ideal regressors out of the X matrix for the regressors of interest. So here's ideal odd and ideal viz. So let's grab, say, either one. Let's just grab the visual one and set. So there's the ideal regressor for the visual task. And now we can very clearly see which is which. So here the uh, auditory responses are pretty big but they're not as big as uh, the responses for the visual so a little auditory bump big visual a little auditory bigger vis visual bunch of small auditory bunch of big visuals so there you have it so in this case at this voxel the response to the visual stimulus is much bigger than to that of the auditory stimulus and conversely um, well let's go to a controller pop up some image if we go to uh, let's let's clusterize and we'll let's find a spot where uh, let's just look at the cluster centers and find big responses so I'll pop all these up here so we can see the effect of clustering right when we do it <coughs> and I will zoom out of this so I'll uncrop it let me just close this window and reopen it so I don't have to ponder the size too hard. So 
uh, remember, remember, controller B on the bottom is actually just showing the time series plot. So let's focus on controller A where we're see seeing the anatomy uh, and then we have uh, the stats, the V minus A statistics overlaid on top of the anatomy. So let's clusterize here. If we click on the blue clusterize button, we're going to look for clusters that survived the threshold. And uh, it asks for a nearest neighbor level, one, two, or three. And three, each voxel has six neighbors because the faces much must touch. So if you make a three by three by three set of cubes, say, or, or shoe boxes, the central box will have six first neighbors. And then uh, if, if the second neighbors can touch, uh, in NN2, that means either the faces or the edges, and that, that will have 18 uh, second neighbors. Uh, that's easier to count if you start at 27, subtract one for the central voxel, and then note that the third uh, neighbors are the, just the, the eight corners of that 3x3x3 three by three by three set of boxes. So uh, 27 minus 1 minus 8 is 18. So there are 18 second neighbors in total, or six of six exactly first and 12 exactly second. Anyway, now that we know who the neighbors are, uh, let's let's uh, just mention this bisided aspect. Uh, typically, in in apnea, we do tests as two-sided, unless you restrict this positive here or specify in this threshold. If I right-click there. You can specify whether you want positive and negative or just one sign. Positive only or negative only. So if you're doing a two-sided test, you should have positives and negatives in the result, presumably. You typically will, I guess. Uh, but typically, you don't really want positives to cluster together with negatives. You'd really want a cluster to uh, each cluster to be positive only or negative only, and that's what bisided means here. Uh, a a two-sided test will allow the two-sided clustering allows positive and negatives to cluster together, but bisided forces them apart. Of course, if your threshold is strict enough, uh, it's unlikely you won't have too many places where the positives and the negatives are at neighboring voxels. So it depends on your threshold. But uh, just to be safe, it's nicer to set the bisided. And that's that's what we that's probably the most natural method because that's what we expect. And then what's the minimum cluster size? We don't really care. We just want the smallest stuff to go away. I'll just leave it as 40. But uh, all that means is uh, if so remember the 40, if I set now the little spots have disappeared. Just to do that again, if I clear it. You see the little noise out there. Let me get the other images up here too. <clears throat> and if I apply it again, watch the little stuff disappear. Uh, and then if we look at the report in the RPT button under clusterize, we see a bunch of clusters here. Let me make that a little taller. Uh, 40 is just how low we will go. If we if we set that cluster size limit to um, 54 voxels that means we draw a line at 54 and anything that isn't that big would disappear so all these smaller clusters would be gone and we'd start at 58 it's just how high up in this list of clusters you would go so we we go down as low as 40 possibly this is a big cluster so we must have positive and negatives connecting there you can kind of see that they would here so if we jump there and have that flash. Actually, no, this is bisided, so we should not have positive and negative uh, in one cluster. So we've got this enormous negative cluster. Uh, and then if I jump to it, here's the biggest positive cluster. That's strange, isn't it? It's, it's basically outside the brain. It looks close to the skull. What in the world would this be? Do I have to write about it in my paper? <coughs> well, presumably we're going to uh, use a brain mask when we correct for multiple comparisons at the group, group level, but we don't really want any of this in our results. If some of this were to bleed in, which it could due to um, 
blurring, since we didn't do blur and mask, for example, uh, you see it's basically outside, but it could blur it, uh, bleed in somewhere. If we get little blobs there, we may have to mention that they, they could be coming from these bigger blobs. So what are these bigger blobs? Well, this looks like it's, it's around the temple or the jaw area. So you could, uh, you know, when people are thinking, sometimes they clench their jaw a little bit or they squint a little bit, and that might happen uh, in correspondence with the task. In fact, if we look at the time series, uh, you see, you see task correspondence there. It's not enormous, but but these big jumps are 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 correlated to the regressors, and and so and in fact, there's a difference between uh, auditory reliable and visual reliable at these voxels. So there you go. There's uh, oops, let me lower this. So there's there is. Uh, we, we see a response here. It's just not actually a bold response, so if we had to, we'd have to explain that in, in a paper. But in the paper, if, if this were masked out and you just saw some little edge clusters bleeding in, you'd have to, you'd have to, you'd probably be inclined to think, oh, well, something's going on in the brain, and you have to think of what that might possibly be. But we would not want to see that in this case. We'd like to see the whole volume before masking it out and say oh this is this is not a bold effect anything from this uh, should not be included in my analysis results okay moving on and, and again that's why the default in AFNIPROC is not to mask the EPI data because we want to see what happens even outside the brain so there's the there's the next big cluster let's let's jump to this whoops I hit the wrong button flash so now now we're in the visual area and where's our visual image our axial image so that's great so that's a, a, a visual ROI so, and this is an auditory ROI that's in the auditory cortex. You see it's negative here. Uh, where does the jump take us to? I should mention that. So um, the cluster is defined by thresholding and clustering. So if you don't, anything that doesn't survive 4.11, positive and negatives are clustered together. And it has to be at least 40 voxels. We have a 363 voxel cluster here. So there is one big cluster. That's our That's our fifth biggest cluster you see. Um, but but why do we go to this this exact voxel? Well, we're jumping to the peak within this cluster, not the center of mask or the eye scent. We're jumping to the peak, and the peak actually comes from the Ole volume. The peak is based on the beta weight. If we change this to be the T-stat, if we color by the t-stat instead of the, the uh, beta weight, well, then our, our range no longer makes sense. Let's uh, just briefly change the range to be, I don't know, 12, just to pick something. But now if we go to the fifth cl biggest cluster and jump to that, now we go to a different location. We're way inside instead of at the edge. So way inside, we have the biggest t-stat, and the t-stat here is negative 11. So that's the largest t-stat in magnitude in this cluster. And as a beta weight, if I change it to 7 and jump again, now we jump out to the edge and we see negative 1.9, basically. And in our plot, that negative 1.9 should be in, seen in the magnitudes. Now the auditory response is 1.9 greater than the uh, visual response. Big, big, small, 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 big, small, etc. Okay, well, I think that's uh, that's exciting. Oh, I want to do one last thing here. As long as I'm in the cluster, clusterize. Let's just to see. Let's plot the average. Say we want to plot the average time series within this cluster. Uh, we hit plot here. It winds at us. It doesn't have any data. So. 
let's give it tell it what data we want to plot so if you go up to the arrow here you can uh, open and close this section and that lets us choose auxiliary data set so let's set the one then we'll choose the auxiliary data set to be um, the all runs that's what we're plotting in black we can choose the fits but uh, let's let's average data to uh, real data instead of uh, model data together so I choose the all runs data set we can keep all of it that's fine and now if we come if we come back down to uh, cluster number five if you forget what cluster you're on you actually can note that by the arrow there there's this pound five that means our current voxel is in the fifth uh, cluster number five if I if I put my mouse there it says crosshairs are in this cluster so if I go to cluster number five now I can plot and there's the average time series within this cluster that's the average of all the black curves within this cluster okay so let's stop uh, let's stop the uh, video there and uh, we'll move on with more more action after and the next one